we're going to go over kind of just the logistics today and then we'll do some math because why wouldn't we do math? And um, yeah. All right. It's officially 210. I can actually start things. Um, so welcome. Welcome. Come on in. Um, some of you may know me. I see a couple familiar faces. My name is James. My last name is Parmenter. You can call me James. I would prefer that you call me James. But if that's not comfortable, I totally get it. You can call me Mr. Parmenter or whatever. Mr. P, if Parmenter is a challenge to say, it can be hard sometimes. Um, this class is pretty straightforward. You come, we do math. A lot of times it's me talking because I'm also recording it so people can watch it later. Um, sometimes it's me having you do problems, but pretty much like it's very straightforward. Uh, let's see here. There's a few details we'll talk about as far as like passing the class and where you can find stuff. But other than that, that's kind of it. So we'll go through the Canvas shell here real quickly. Um, if you have questions, please ask them. And then I think we'll just get started talking about antiderivatives. So uh, let's see, here's the nitty gritty. So here's the syllabus on Canvas, which is currently the homepage. I'm gonna change the homepage to the modules really quickly because that's actually where you'll probably want to go to find stuff. Come on in. Uh, let's see. So you can always join class via Zoom if you want. I think there's one or two people on Zoom right now. That's totally fine. I will also record the classes and post them later. Um, what else? How can you reach me? Usually by emailing me is the best way to reach me if you want to get a hold of me. You can also find me in office hours. You can also sometimes find me in my office. Sometimes. Uh, let's see here. There's my office hours all listed right there. I'm in drop-in. I'm in C class, which is the Center for Chicano Latino Academic Student Success. I'm in CAD, which is the Center for African Diaspora Student Success. You can find me those days and times. Office hours start in math drop-in on October 8th and in the Student Success Centers on October 3rd, which is on Monday. So that's when you can start. So not this week, next week in the Student Success Centers and then the following Sundays when drop in in the lower level of the library starts. Grading. So this class, fairly straightforward grading. It's pass, no pass. The passing grade is 75%. Um, I added, I decided to add a component to the class this quarter because I felt like it added a lot of value for students last time I did it. So in addition to attendance, you will also need to do weekly reflections. They are not hard. It's like write a few sentences, tell me a joke if you want to, ask, answer a question about what was the best thing you watched or what you read or something you ate. Like, And also a couple of questions about your class. Like what did you do in your class this week? How do you think you're doing in your class this week? Basic stuff, easy to do. It's not hard. Um, there's no math questions on there. So it's really just like, I just want to get to know you a little better and also know how you think your class is going. Um, what else? Oh, and then this form. So it, some of you might have already filled out the attendance form. This is what it looks like. It's pretty easy to fill out. You put your email there. You put your student ID number there. You put your name. Like, here's how I would write my name. Your first name first, your second name second, or your surname, I guess, second. Nothing else, no commas, just straightforward. And then what class you're attending, how you attended, and the date you're attending for. So today, all of us would put in 09, what, 26, 27? Good question, 27, uh, 2023. Ask away. OK. And then you, oh yeah, question. which many of you are, right? Many of you have just been added to Canvas. Yes, you do. And the reason is because we keep track of all of our data. So we need to keep track of how many students we serve regardless of you're enrolled in the class or not. So yes, 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 please everybody do this regardless of whether you've registered via Schedule Builder or if you've just been added using the Google form. Thank you for asking, appreciate it. What else? Um, and so, oh, the other thing about that is if let's say you are not in class today and you're watching this video tomorrow, then that's still the date you'll put in because you're watching the class that happened on 9 27 23. Make sense? Cool. Helps me keep track of the attendance because for people who actually have to have their attendance marked because they're getting a grade for the class, it makes it easier for me to make sure everyone's straightforward. Everyone should pass this class. It's not hard to pass this class. You just have to come and do the things. 
Uh, let's see, what else? If you're absent from class, you can make up classes by watching the video later and filling out the attendance form. Not passing isn't the end of the world, it's a workload class. Are there questions about attendance? Okay, if there are other questions later, you're welcome to ask, I'm an open book. Then the rest of the stuff is stuff we could kind of just not read about this class. If something's impacting you, please don't hesitate to talk to me. Or if it's me that's impacting you, you can, there's like an AATC feedback form. There's other places you can say things about if I'm doing something terrible. I don't think that's going to be an issue. But if it is, you shouldn't hesitate to let some like, if you feel like James is really doing something that's like causing you problems, which I've never had an issue with. But you never know. I could do something terrible. I don't think I will. Um, please talk to someone. Let someone know. That's true for your other classes as well. If something's happening, you should really let someone know. Um, let's see, live class, you know when and where it is because you're all here. I'm gonna do stuff, you're gonna do stuff. Um, combinations and uni universal design for learning, something I can do to improve your ability to succeed. Please let me know, I'm happy to try new things. Uh, also probably help other people as well. Slowing down is one thing I've been told maybe to do occasionally. So I will try to talk a little slower sometimes, write a little bigger. Sometimes I write too small. So if you feel like I'm writing too small, you can say that too, because it is going to be up there. It might be hard to see. Uh, let's see. If you have formal accommodations through student disabilities, uh, can I say the words? Through the Student Disability Center, um, please let me know. It usually doesn't really make much of a difference in this class because I'm recording things already and there's not any exams or anything. But even if that's the case, you should let me know if you think I should know. Now, uh, let's see what else. Zoom instructions. I think we're all pros at Zoom at this point. Some notes about the class. So this class is worth one workload unit. That means it counts towards being a full-time student and towards whatever financial aid requirements are necessary, but it doesn't count towards graduation, towards the 225 unit cap that we all have. Um, as math generally works, the stuff you learn now is related to the stuff you learn later. So it usually kind of just builds and builds and builds. A little less true in 17C, like at the very end of the quarter, the last like two weeks is like total left turn. But most of the time stuff is pretty connected. I know this is 17B, but I'm just, so in your future, if you're taking 17C, the last couple of weeks is just like probability and stats. And it's kind of, it's, they try to connect it, but they don't do it very well. So we'll do our best. Let's see, and then yeah, students then, successful students usually spend 10 to 20 hours per week doing homework for a class. Like, so this class, 10 to 20 hours a week seems like a lot, but not unreasonable. What else, where can you get more help? Office hours, see above. Grant's website is also a, always a useful resource that I refer students to. Um, you should check it out. He's got good handouts there. Come on in, welcome to Co17B. Um, there's AATC tutoring, there's drop-in tutoring, there's also individual tutoring, there's lots and lots of places you can get help. And then you should get to know each other. In fact, mm, yeah, take, oh yeah, question. Yes, excellent question. So because of way back when, when 17 ABC was first actually a class at UC Davis, we at the AATC didn't want, we were like, not sure if it was really a thing in the last while. So we didn't like create a new class code for it. So it'll show up as 16B or next quarter 16, co 16C. So yeah, no worries. It should be, if you're here, if this is the right time, right place you have, you're in the right class, but it will show up as 16B for all of you. If you're registered for the course, you're scheduled. Um, let's see, what else? Sure, why don't we take two minutes and introduce yourselves to one or two people around you. For real. Now. Yeah, and I know you didn't get that. Oh, I'm sorry. 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 I'm sor
All right. Good. You all are great. You're each other's resources. You really should talk to each other, study with each other. You are the best place to help from each other, to be honest. So continue to talk to each other as, as the quarter progresses, please. Um, you might make a friend. Anyway, let's see. What else do you got here? So this is kind of in the way. Let's move that. The other thing in Canvas, the place where you'll probably actually use Canvas the most is in the modules. Um, you can find stuff there. There's the link to the class attendance form. So I would recommend bookmarking it so you don't have to like scan the dumb QR code every time you're in class. That's what, bookmarking is easy, but do whatever you want. There's a link to the Zoom. There's a link to the playlist on YouTube that has videos from last time I taught this class, and I will post the videos from class there as well. Um, I've also, I can post them in Canvas if you would like, but I think it's just as easy to go to YouTube. So if if there's a real call for it, let me know. I'm just going to post them in YouTube unless people really want me to post them in Canvas. Um, same thing goes for the class notes. They're going to meet. So you can, I mean, here we can take a look at, oh, sure, yeah. So there's the YouTube playlist. It's not particularly exciting or eventually it's there, right? So you can see like the last stuff from last time and it's not, it's not sorted. So you can probably sort it how you want. I would sort it by date added newest. So you can see the final review from last time I taught this class and so on and so on and so on. Similarly, back to modules, you can see there'll be a link to the class notes which annoyingly is opening like this. I would love it if it just opened it and when I clicked on it, but there aren't any notes there right now. So not very exciting. And then back to modules one more time and other stuff. There's my office hours, grants web. So all the stuff on the syllabus page is like actually here in an easy to find spot. Um, there's also some old video lessons that we made a while ago that are shorter. So if you're looking for a specific topic, you might look there as well. Um, let's see if I can open this without, yeah, that's a better way of doing it. And then my website, which is not useful at all. You really shouldn't go there. There's nothing good except for a picture of me and my cat. There's also like when and where I, like my office hours and the classes I teach, but like there's no, there's no like good handouts there. Everything's here. Um, there are some useful links here. There's a slope field generator, which is something that you don't actually have to be able to draw really in this class, but it's nice to be able to visualize at some point. So when we start talking about slope fields or direction fields, we'll probably refer back to this. Like, oh yeah, you can kind of get an idea of how things look. Um, there's And there's a couple different ones there. There's also a handout on Euler's method, which that's later in the quarter. And then there's the chapters of the textbook that are relevant to this quarter. So if you happen to not have the textbook on hand and want to look at a not terrible one where you have to scroll down to the bottom and click a thing to go to the next page, like it's just a nice PDF, they're there. Um, yeah, question. I did. I wasn't going to do that. I mean, I, if you really want me to, I can. It, it, it's a little bit more work. It's not a lot more work, but I can totally do that. I, cause it's Yeah, it's just, I can put them in Canvas too. I don't mind. Or watch a video later. So when you, whenever you watch the video, whether it's right now live on Zoom or later on after I posted the recording, once you've watched the video, then you go fill out the question. Attendance form, yes. And then James is happy because everyone saw the attendance form. 
that's it. That's really like, it's, it's not complicated. It's not meant to be like something tricky. It's just like, you felt you had this one. Other questions? Okay. At some point, I'll try to learn your names. Not today, though. I have to figure out which screen I'm sharing again here. One second. So usually I don't share from my, oh, I have to, yeah. There's a number of things I need here. Usually I don't share from my laptop. I'm going to share from here. So I'm going to be recording here. So that's my laptop. Let me make sure things are all set up here the right way. Let's see. Doc cam. Okay. Yes. Some all displays. Cool. And then I need to be Zoom sharing my screen. It's always kind of a, it's much easier in our classrooms because everything's kind of integrated nicely. And these classrooms that are not in the Dutton Hall, it's a little more convoluted, but we can make it work. So now let me share that. I think we should be good to go. Okay. What time is it? 2.26. What time do we end? Three o'clock? Okay. Should be all right. I'm guessing for those of you that have been to class already today that you might have talked about antiderivatives. Sure, okay, no, no worries. I'm guessing that was derivatives. Yeah. Okay, sure. So yeah, I mean, we're here to do math. Let's do some math. All right, so I should grab my notes. Is that actually it's notes? Good to have notes. I mean, sometimes there's some little real estate up here. It's it's a little challenging. One second. Yeah, this will work. Yeah, maybe that'll work. Okay, well, let's do that. Then. Today is the twenty seventh of September. Let's talk about we'll talk about derivatives and antiderivatives because really they're very related. Antiderivatives. Not a spelling class, by the way. So you all know I might make some spelling errors. It's not a crime. So let's just start off with what might be a not terrible example. Let's say we've got this function. F of x is x to the fourth plus the square root of x plus one over x to the seventh. And we would like to find its antiderivative. Meaning if we took, if we were going to find a function and if we take the derivative of that function, it should be that function. There's some typical naming for this. Usually we use uppercase function letters for antiderivatives. There's actually a, a different name we'll use like an integral symbol shortly. But for now, we, we're not talking about the integral yet. So we're pretending like it doesn't exist. So we're going to say, okay, well, we want to find the antiderivative. So we're thinking, okay, the antiderivative is looking like capital F of X. That's the anti-derivative. I'm already writing tiny, okay. So, oh, but what I'm really thinking here, sorry, is that F capital F prime of X is this little function F of X. So the derivative of capital F is little f, and then we're going to find regular capital F of X, which is going to be the anti-derivative of little f of X. I know it's kind of dumb, right? It's like, yes, I know. So capital F prime is F of X. And before we start thinking about what the antiderivative is, we're gonna make our lives easier. We're gonna rewrite all of these powers of X in a much easier way. We're gonna write this as X to the fourth plus X to the one half plus X to the negative seventh. All right. Now we have to think of a function whose derivative is x to the fourth. Well, I know that when I take a derivative, the power gets to be one less, right? Like the derivative of x cubed is 3x squared. So the derivative, of x, some, the derivative of something that is going to end up having a derivative that's x to the fourth should have an x to the fifth power. But that's not quite the whole story. Because the derivative of x to the fifth is what? Right, 5x to the fourth. But we don't want a 5x to the fourth. We want just a 1x to the fourth. So we're going to divide by 5. 
to account for the five that we would end up multiplying by. Similarly, the power for x to the one half, or I should say the power for the antiderivative of x to the one half needs to be one larger. So we need x to the one half plus one, which is three halves. And we have to divide by that as well. Same deal over here. For x to the negative seventh, we need x to the new power is going to be negative seven plus one. And we need to divide by that as well. And there's one more thing. We, we're going to simplify this because this looks terrible right now. But there's one more thing we need. What's the derivative of 19? Yeah. Right. But really, I mean, okay, I'm being a little silly. It doesn't have to be 19, right? It could be any constant. So what we actually typically write here is plus any constant C. So now let's make this look a little less terrible. So we're going to write this as capital F of X is, you can either write this as X to the fifth over five, or you can write it as one fifth times X to the fifth. Either way is really totally legitimate. Here, I'm going to write this as two thirds X to the three halves. And here, minus one sixth X to the negative six plus C. That is my antiderivative of this function. How can we check? Well, we can check by taking the derivative. So here's the fun thing about derivatives and antiderivatives. They literally should undo each other. If you do one of them to a function and they do the other one to a function, you should end up back where you started. Um, I should say with one small caveat, if you've done a derivative first and an antiderivative second, then you'll have a plus C at the end, which you might not have started with. But other than that, things are gonna be the same. Kind of like inverse functions. If you do an inver a function and then it's an inverse function, you end up back where you started. Derivatives and antiderivatives are kind of like inverse operations. If you do one and then you do the other, you get back to where you started. Let's check. So if we take the derivative of f of x, of capital F of x, we're going to get one fifth times five x to the fourth plus two thirds times the derivative of x to the power is that power times x to that power minus one, which is one half minus one six times the derivative of x to the negative sixth is negative six times x to the negative six minus one is negative seven. Derivative of c is zero. And then simplifying, one fifth times five is one, two thirds times three halves is one, minus one six times minus six is one. And we're exactly back at the function we started with. So you can always check that your antiderivative is correct by taking the derivative of your result. Of course, that all depends on your ability to do things correctly in the first place, right? If, you, if you're making mistakes taking the antiderivative, you might be making the same sort of mistakes taking the derivative, so just be careful. Um, the other thing I'll say is you never really have to check. Right? If you've taken an antiderivative, assuming you are doing things correctly, there's no need to check that your antiderivative is correct. You can just be like, yeah, we're good to go. Let's do a little more practice. Let's look at something. In fact, yeah, let's look at one more and then we'll have to get a few couple. Also, for those of you on Zoom, sorry, I haven't been paying much attention to you, but if you have questions, you are welcome to chime in in the chat or to unmute yourself. Um, for some reason, the chat does not seem to want to be like showing up for me here, so... Maybe the chat's not such a good option here. They can certainly, yeah, I see, I see, I see the thumb, so that's great. But for some reason, the chat's just like, no, no dice. Okay. Um, yeah, I know, exactly. Me too. So let's look at some other examples here. Sorry, where's my paper? Oh, that's sorry. Trying to keep papers organized here so I can post notes later. Let's look at this example. Let's say our function is f of x equal to three times x to the eighth plus two e to the x plus four cosine of x plus six x plus eight. In fact, before we find the antiderivative, let's just find the derivative. Let's find lowercase f prime of x. Why don't you all find lowercase f prime of x? 
I'll refrain from walking around and looking at papers right now, but especially because there's not a lot of room to walk around back there. So. If we have a drip, I thought I'd posted, I'll definitely post later, a handout about derivatives and antiderivatives, just listing some of the basic ones. Um, oh, come on, get out of the way here. So the derivative here, just using our regular differentiation rules, derivative of three times x to the eighth is three times eight x to the seventh, which is gonna be 24 x to the seventh. Constant multiples hang out is what I like to say. So I've got two times e to the x, the derivative is two times, okay, everybody, what's the derivative of e to the x? Right, okay, good. And then ooh, what's the derivative? Cosine of x. Negative sine of x. So I really should have written minus, but I lost my shot here, so I'm gonna write minus negative four sine of x. Derivative six x is six, derivative eight is zero. Go ahead and write the zero. The trig functions are definitely in play. Yeah. So in fact, I was going to take a moment here just after this, and we'll talk, we'll write them all down real quickly here. So let's look at the antiderivative. So the antiderivative capital F. Let's see. So looking back at the original function, instead of subtracting one from the power, or I should say, instead of multiplying by the power and subtracting one to get the new one. We we're adding one to the power and then dividing by the new power. So we're going to get three times x to the ninth over nine for any x to a power. But for e to the x, just like the derivative is two to the e to the x, the antiderivative is also two e to the x. The antiderivative of cosine. So what's a function whose derivative is equal to cosine? Yeah, positive sign. So we get four sine of x. The antiderivative of six x is six x squared over two. The antiderivative of eight is eight times x. And then we slap on a constant. And if it were me, I would simplify. I would write this as x to the ninth over three plus two e to the x plus four sine of x, plus three x squared, plus eight x. Let's see. All right. So since we're there, we might as well talk about derivatives and antiderivatives of the trig functions because they are definitely still valid. They're gonna be asked about them. They're gonna be around. Are right, the questions about this though, before I move on. It's really okay to have questions. I'm happy to say things, address things. Like, if you got them, everyone's got them probably. Yeah. So, so just as a reminder, we're looking at this as our original function. So when I'm anti-differentiating this, I've got a 6x to the 1 right there. And so, right, and so when I take the, or another way to think about it is what's the derivative of 3x squared? Anybody? 6x to the first, which is exactly that right there. So the, since the derivative of 3x squared is 6x, the antiderivative of 6x is 3x squared. But you're right. The pattern, in fact, let me write, before I answer your question, the pattern we're generally looking at here is what I typically call the anti-power rule. which is that if your function is x to some power, then the antiderivative is x to that power plus one divided by that same power plus one. And before I ask your question or address your question, what's the only value of p that might end up being a problem here? Negative one, right? Because negative one plus one is zero and we can't divide by zero. So you can't do this if the power is negative one. Question. Is for the four cosine x, yes. not just tangle on that because there's no x. Like if it was four x cosine x, then would we? That'd be more of a product rule situation, okay. actually. If it was more like four cosine of x squared or cosine of six x, where it's a function of a function, that's when you would use chain rule. But, right, there are four cosine x. Right. 
what I'm really using here for the uh, for the four cosine x is I'm using what's called the constant multiple rule. Whereas if you have a constant multiplied by a function, I just think of the constant as hanging out. And then you either take the derivative or antiderivative as appropriate. Um, yeah. Cool. Let's talk about the trig functions for a second. So, yeah, we'll make a we'll make a quick list here. Function derivative. So we've got sine of x and cosine of x. The derivative of sine is derivative of cosine is. And then we've got tangent and cotangent. Derivative of tangent of x is secant squared of x. Derivative of cotangent of x is right. There's actually a really kind of nice pattern there, right? The derivative of tangent is secant squared. The derivative of listen to my emphasis here, cotangent is cosecant squared, but there's a minus sign. And the same pattern works for secant and cosecant. The derivative of secant of x is secant of x times tangent of x. The derivative of cosecant of x, same deal. We get a cosecant x and a cotangent x and a negative in front. Yes, of course, anytime you ask. There's often an issue I encounter, so don't hesitate to say something. Yeah, in fact, yeah. Um, so now here's the thing. You also now have a list of antiderivatives. If you have a, if you know a list of derivatives, you know a list of antiderivatives. The antiderivative of cosine is sine. The antiderivative of negative sine is positive cosine, or the antiderivative of sine is negative cosine. In fact, let's make yeah, sure. Let's just write the, no, that's a bad way to do that, James. I want to make it easy, but I can't. So I'm going to have to make another list. So here's another way to do this. I probably could have done this more smoothly, but sometimes it just doesn't happen. Now we have our function and the associated antiderivative. And really all we're going to do is just move where the negative is because that's how we do it. So the antiderivative of cosine, I'm still going to make the list of normal way though. The antiderivative of sine is negative cosine. The antiderivative of cosine is positive sine. But what am I forgetting? The antiderivative of secant squared is tangent plus c. The antiderivative of cosecant squared is negative cotangent plus c. And then for the funky ones, the antiderivative of secant x tangent x is secant of x plus c. And the antiderivative of cosecant of x times cotangent of x is negative cosecant of x. Let's see. But really the rule of thumb you should be thinking about is if you know that this is the derivative of that, then you know that the antiderivative of that is this, right? It's just a backwards and forwards relationship. Cool. Questions about these? Other than should you memorize them? And the answer is yes, you should. Really? Okay. Yeah. So, like, I don't know what I Yeah, it's okay. We can definitely talk more about trig. Um, what I would say is, I've certainly, to help people memorize these, encourage them to make it the lock screen on their phone. 
it's a very it, I, it's something I've done before when I had to memorize something to teach to students. I was like, there's a lot of things this really weird math thing means. I need to memorize this. I looked at it every like, you know, how many times you look at your phone a day? I looked at it that many times a day and it was it got in there. So that's one useful way to memorize things, I would say. Let's look at a few more examples of antiderivatives and then we'll come. Yeah, we've only had 14 more minutes. So here's another example. Let's say our function looks like 2x cubed plus 3 times 4x squared minus x. And I want to find the antiderivative. Well, okay, I'm about to say it's kind of a lie, but not really. There's no real anti product rule. There's no anti product rule. That's kind of not true, but it's true enough. If you have a product of things, really you should just multiply it out and then do the antiderivative. So we're gonna simplify this. In fact, that's good advice in general. If you can simplify something before trying to find its derivative or antiderivative or whatever, it's often a good idea to do so. So if we foil this out, two x cubed times four x squared is eight x to the fifth. And then I've got minus two x to the fourth plus 12 x squared minus three x. And I'm just gonna use my anti-power rule. I'm gonna write capital G because that's the convention for antiderivatives for now. And I'm just adding one to the power, dividing by the new power. And you get eight X to the sixth over six, minus two X to the fifth over five, plus 12 X cubed over three, minus three X squared over two, plus a constant. I should point out, we're using a rule that we haven't even talked about, which is totally fine. The rule that if you add or subtract a bunch of functions together and you want to take their antiderivative, you just do each part and then add or subtract the results together. That's all we're doing here, right? We're really doing the antiderivative of this minus the antiderivative of this plus the anti, right? It works just like how derivatives work. And then since I can't help it, we should simplify. This is four thirds X to the sixth minus two fifths x to the fifth plus four x cubed minus three halves x squared. Let's we'll see. Anyone using web work this quarter? Anyone know? Okay. I know that the class is met already. I think he's having you guys like, he's writing problems and having you submit them on Gradescope. That's, I mean, that's cool. I like that. It sounds like he's, they're going to get graded, which is awesome. So good for him. I'm happy he's doing that. I think that's, it's a lot of work. And I think it is worth his time to do that for his students or his graders or graduate students. Whoever's doing the grading, I'm glad that's happening for you. Let's look at one more example, kind of similar. Let's say we've got something like f of x equal to 2x squared minus 5x plus 4, all divided by the square root of x. And as you might have guessed, just like there isn't an anti-product rule, there isn't an anti-quotient rule. So the rule of thumb here is simplify when you can. I'm going to rewrite this. I'm going to rewrite it as... 2x squared over x to the one half minus 5x over x to the one half plus 4 over x to the one half. Now, I can't just start applying the anti power rule yet. I have to simplify this even further. Is equal to, let's see, 2x squared divided by x to the one half. I subtract the powers, I get 2x to the three halves. x to the first divided by x to the one half, I subtract the powers. I get 5x to the 1 minus 1 half is 1 half. And then 4 over x to the 1 half is just 4x to the negative 1 half. All I've done so far is simplify. I haven't actually done any anti-differentiating yet. But now I'm going to. So now I'm going to write capital F of x, my antiderivative, 
So here's where we start to move a little quicker. We're gonna be like, well, I don't wanna write two X to the five halves divided by five halves when I know that dividing by five halves is the same as multiplying by two fifths. So typically what people start to do is say, okay, I know I'm gonna get two, they leave themselves a little space. I'm gonna get X to the five halves and then dividing by five halves is the same as multiplying by two fifths. I'm still gonna simplify that, but I think that's a little better. Same deal here. Five space, I'm gonna get X to the three halves and then multiply by two thirds. Same deal here, four space, and the X to the positive one half multiplied by two. And just instead of dividing by one half, I multiply by the reciprocal. So dividing by three halves and multiply by the reciprocal. So dividing by five halves and multiply by the reciprocal. And then, yes, we simplify. We get four fifths x to the five halves. Oh, what did I forget? Plus c. I did the antiderivative. I need to write the plus c. And then I get a minus 10 thirds x to the three halves plus eight x to the one half. Plus c. Don't hesitate with questions. If you got them, I'm happy to hear them. All right, I think we've covered almost every type of function that you really are expected to be able to differentiate or anti-differentiate with a couple exceptions. So let's look at one more problem. Well, not just one more. I, I will say one more until the end of class. One more, just one more, just one more, one more problem. And let's look at one more problem. Let's say we want to find the antiderivative of h of x equal to one over x plus one over x squared plus one plus secant squared of x. One over x is the exception. Right, that's x to the negative first. And we cannot use the anti-power rule there because we'd be dividing by zero. So we have to reach back in our memory and think, okay, I know back in 17a, we learned a function that if you took the derivative of that function, you got one over x. It's everyone's like favorite function, not really. It's a most hated function, probably. What do we take the derivative to get one over x? Nothing. Natural log. Now, here's the thing here, which is extra terrible. Natural log is not good enough. The reason why are some domain issues. So let me ask everybody really quick here. For one over x, this is kind of a, a little more challenging question. What's the domain of one over x? Or really, what's not in the domain of one over x? Uh, you meant something else, I think. Zero, right? Zero, x can't be zero. Everything else is fine, right? X can be two or three or five or negative 10 or whatever, but x can't be zero. But for the natural log function, the domain is less. For the natural log function, you only get the right side where x is positive. And the problem here really, the real actual nitty gritty problem here is that when you take an antiderivative of a function, it shouldn't have a smaller domain. You should be able to say, oh, this new function I have, that's the antiderivative, I should still be able to take its derivative and get back the original function with the same as big domain. So taking an antiderivative and getting a smaller domain is kind of something that shouldn't happen. So the way we fix that is by saying it's the natural log of the absolute value of x. Now x can be positive or negative, just like x can be positive or negative here. And it totally does work. Like if you actually graph this, take its derivative, its derivative is one over x, whether x is positive or negative. It's kind of cool. Um, okay, here's another fun one. I'll tell you, it's not gonna be the natural log of x squared plus one. I don't know why this is the one function you're supposed to know versus the other five that are out there. But for some reason, there's an expectation in this class that you know that the derivative of the arc tangent of x is one over x squared plus one. Or if you prefer, the inverse tangent.
And just to carry on with the tangent theme, which function has a derivative that's secant squared? Good old tangent of x. Question. So is the derivative of one x squared plus one r tangent? No, the derivative of r tangent of x is equal to one over x squared plus one. Okay. The antiderivative of one over x squared plus one is equal to r tangent of x. I know, it one's kind of funky. Um, there's not a lot to say about it right this moment. Yes, let me, in fact, let me write it down more specifically. So the derivative of the natural log of x is equal to one over x. And that's kind of corresponds to if f of x equals one over x, then the antiderivative is the natural log of the absolute value of x plus c. I'm just writing it down for all three of them, or for all two of them. And similarly here, the derivative of arc tangent of x is equal to one over one plus x squared, or one over x squared plus one, either way you want to write it. I, some, I go back and forth. That corresponds to if your function was one over one plus x squared, then your antiderivative is the arc tangent of x plus c. Or inverse tangent. I prefer to write arc tangent. I feel like it's less confusing. People see inverse tangent, and sometimes they think one over tangent, which is not the same thing. One over tangent is cotangent, very different than arc tangent. Um, yeah. Time. Just a couple minutes. Mm. All right, I'm gonna leave you with this because this is where we're gonna go next time. So let's say our function was cosine of six X. And I wanted to find the antiderivative. So let me ask you an easier question first. What's the antiderivative of cosine of X? Negative times X. That's the derivative. Positive sine of x. So I know my antiderivative should be something like sine of the same thing. Someone I once heard a student said the function is kind of like a bodyguard. The stuff inside that really can't be changed or messed with. So the 6x inside the cosine function can't change. It's got to stay the same. So when I take the antiderivative, I get sine of 6x, but that's not quite right. Well, yes, you're right, but even there's something else I'm also missing. Good call, definitely plus C. Um, if we take the derivative here, and I use the chain rule, the derivative sine of some stuff is cosine of the stuff, but then what would I have to multiply by? The derivative of the inside, which is six, but I don't have a six there. So how do I account for multiplying by six? By dividing by six. If I do that, then things work out perfectly. So here's what we typically call in in AATC speed, like at the AATC, this is language you use all the time. But we typically call this as a mini U substitution, which I know we haven't talked about U substitutions yet, but we're going to do them eventually. And this is like the idea of, well, you can just skip and be like, I know that since I'm multiplying by a constant here, I'm going to end up dividing by that constant when I take the antiderivative. Just like you would end up multiplying by that constant when you took the derivative. There's definitely a derivative multiply, antiderivative divide kind of dichotomy going on here. Is that what you mean? Say that one more time. Oh, why? Yeah, so um, that's actually, I think, for integration by parts, actually. But but you're, you're yes, you're saying the right things. Um, but U substitution, really, when you hear the words U substitution, what you should be thinking of is you're undoing the chain rule. That's all we're doing here, is we're undoing the chain rule. Like, how do you undo this like this kind of thing? Oh, we divide by six here. So what is F prime of X? So, well, I was, so I was, I was saying that if I just had sine of six X, F prime would be cosine of, I know it got kind of messy there, I'm sorry. Let me write that here. Sorry. F prime of X. Without the one six there, it was cosine of bless you six x times six. But since I don't want the times six, I multiply by a one six so that they would cancel out and just get cosine of six x. So I can be like, oh yeah, now I can see that this capital F of x 
one sixth sine of six x plus b is actually the antiderivative of cosine of six x. All right, it's three o'clock. I should stop talking.